live in a unique area when it comes to gardening in Arizona. We have tomatoes! Instead of flat lowlands of desert, our area is known as the White Mountains. We're located in northeastern Arizona on the Mogollon Rim. Geologically, the rim is an escarpment of steep, high vertical cliffs of limestone and sandstone up to 8,000 feet in elevation. The rim defines the Colorado Plateau on the south and stretches 200 miles from central Arizona going east to the New Mexico border. Once you're on top of the rim and travel north, you get to Sholo and the White Mountains and a large volcanic field of cinder cones and dormant volcanoes. We're surrounded by 405 volcanoes and lava tubes that are relatively young. According to geologic terms, young means 300,000 to 2 million years old. Today, the volcanoes remain dormant. We reside in the Springerville Volcanic Field, which includes the area from Springerville south to Mount Baldy, north to Greens Peak, west to Pine Top Lakeside and Sholo, north to Concho, and back down towards Springerville. The salt lava covers more than 1,200 square miles. This is a tough situation for farming and gardening. One of the more prominent volcanoes is right in our front yard, Porter Mountain. Porter Mountain is a major landmark but we won't see an eruption anytime soon. However, the surrounding area is littered with rock, cinder, clay, and silt. This information is important because it gives us a clue as to what kind of soil we're dealing with when trying to establish a garden. There are basic steps to follow when beginning a garden here or anywhere else. Number one, decide what you'd like to grow. Number two, choose a location that gets plenty of sun. Number three, plan your garden beds and think about companion planting. Number four, Test your soil and prepare the soil with amendments. Number five, choose the right seeds or transplants. Number six, nurture your garden with composting, watering, weeding, and harvesting. Make a list of your favorite veggies to grow. Then, check to see if they will grow well in this area. We live in Zone 6B according to the USDA Hardiness Zone Map, but you may also have microclimates around your home. A microclimate is the climate of a very small or restricted area that is different from the general climate of the surrounding area. But your garden location may be affected by water, mass, and wind blocks, which are the three aspects that can create microclimates. Elevation can create a microclimate. Valleys, berms, and trees can reduce wind and trap moisture. Large buildings can also function like a tree line and reduce wind and store heat. Open areas without a windbreak create a local microclimate. Most crops need full sun with a minimum of five hours of direct sunlight per day. 
Greens, herbs, and root crops will grow in a semi-shaded area. It is better to water plants from below rather than spraying from above. Less water is lost through evaporation. Foliage stays dry and minimizes disease problems. Plan your garden beds and think about companion planting. Will you plant in ground or use raised beds or containers? In ground is the usual gardening choice and offers more room than a raised bed and it's also usually the cheapest. Raised beds are favored because of easy access and less weeds. Container planting offers easy access and portability, but it's limited in size. It's all a personal choice. When planting your garden, keep in mind companion planting. The Society of Plants has its likes and dislikes. You should know the plants that are compatible with each other and protect each other and nurture each other. Some combinations of plants do not work. Beans and any member from the Allium family, such as garlic, onions, chives, do not grow well together. Allium family members stunt their growth. And beans do not grow well with beets or peppers. Companion plants for beans are squash, corn, cabbage, strawberries, and tomatoes, just to name a few. Carrots grow well with beans, garden peas, lettuce, onions, and tomatoes. Carrots do not grow well with dill, parsnips, and parsley. Fennel is kind of like the unwanted neighbor. There are very few plants that are compatible with fennel, except a close relative called dill. Marigolds are great companions for all plants. They're used for pest control because they have a very noxious odor and mask the scent of vegetables. Marigold roots and stems emit a chemical that helps suppress the population of root knot nematodes, tiny microscopic round parasitic worms that feed on the roots of ornamental plants and vegetables. Gardeners use trap plants to attract pests as a distraction from other vegetables within the garden. Some plants protect their companions from disease and pests, while other compatible plants help to nurture and feed their neighbors. The whole understanding of plants living with other plants is an interesting social order within the garden. Keeping good companions in the garden pays off in flavor and abundance. Test the soil for pH. Is it alkaline or acidic? Volcanic soil is usually alkaline. It is. It is. But we're going to let that sit for about five minutes, and that's all you have to do with pH, and that's not too hard, is no, it? No, I can no. handle that. I can okay. do that. <laughs> many of you know that when you have limestone, and limestone came from this being underwater many millions of years ago, that limestone has a higher pH. Lime is used to raise the pH, and that makes, and that's one of the other things that makes our soil alkaline, which, which we're testing today. Most plants grow well from a 6.5 to 7.0, which is the neutral range on the pH scale. Yours I is an 8.5. We decided that that's pretty. We need to add oh, look at that green. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's darker you're much higher. than this. Oh, okay. So you're high in pH. Let me see. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. about an 8.0. Oh, oh yeah, I'd there it is. Isn't that, yeah, that's like... This one is quite dark. It's like an emerald green. green. Are, which one, which is which? You see garden? If you have and this is Nancy's. For some of the soil microbes, the bacteria that use that, and then they're going to release the acid from the sulfur, and that's what lowers the pH. As a result, if I added the sulfur to the soil right now, 
and took the pH afterwards, it's not going to change. Give me six weeks, okay. you're going okay. to see a big change. And in a year, even better. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Long term. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Now, the other thing is, is since we always are using water, and since our water is a higher pH, soil sulfur is not a one-time thing. It's a good thing to do in the beginning of the spring of each really? year. Really? Every year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not mm -hmm. as much. Not Again, as much. How, oh, how, how, how are we going to know how much to add? How much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is in the soil? There's three other tests, and these are called macronutrients. Mm. Macro means nutrients that are in large amounts that plants need. By no means all the nutrients that plants need, just like us. Mm -hmm. um, those macronutrients are nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. We have absolutely no problem no deficiencies in potassium up here because most of our soil comes from a rock called feldspar mm. oh. and that is and there is a particular kind of feldspar if you've ever noticed some stones that have yellow on them a little bit they look like yellowish sandstone that's actually potassium and so much of the soil is made from that and so we have an abundance of potassium here is feldspar um, volcanic feldspar is the is is the kind of rock that makes up the majority of the crust of the earth, oh, actually. Okay. So not necessarily volcanic? No, because okay. volcanic is it's something right. from it's lower that down. right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Therefore, it's wise to check the pH level, as well as levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in your garden before dropping one seed in the ground. The right pH range in the soil provides a healthy environment so plants can mature and fight diseases as well as fight insect infestations. It's necessary to reinforce your crop's survival of the fittest even in the plant world. In choosing seeds, remember to check to see if the crops that you pick will grow here. A lot of greens and lettuces need partial shade and cooler temperatures. If it gets too hot, many will bolt and grow flowers that go to seed. Think about starting greens early in the season and wait until it gets cooler after the summer heat to start your fall crop. Follow the instructions on the seed packets. Plant according to distance between plants and plant at the recommended depth for the seeds. How many days until germination? How many days until harvest? Soak larger seeds overnight to increase germination. Don't soak tiny seeds like basil, lettuce, kale, Some of the best instructions and general information about gardening are found in seed catalogs. Order seed catalogs or go online to do some research on the kind of seeds to purchase for your area. Some seeds need to go through a special process before planting. Cold stratification. There are seeds that need to be exposed to cold and wet conditions before they can properly germinate. Before cold stratification, the seeds are dormant. It's necessary to mimic the exact conditions required in nature in order to break the dormancy. Some gardeners cold stratify seeds by spraying a napkin or paper towel with water, placing them in a baggie, and storing the seeds in the refrigerator for a few weeks. 
Seeds needing cold stratification are evening primrose, perennial sweet pea, sedum, hens and chicks, hardy hibiscus, lavender, hollyhock, and milkweed. Milkweed. It's a very popular seed to plant in order to provide the only habitat that supports the monarch butterfly. Milkweed needs a lot of sun, and it's especially important to plant the seeds in the early spring while it's still cold or in the fall. Seed Scarification This is another method to ensure successful seed germination. Okay, so um, on the seeds, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's this place where the, the little plant will come out. So you do not want to damage that. The little plant starts coming out. So you want to do, you want to scarf it on a side so you don't damage the little place where the plant comes out. You rub it until you see just a little bit of, the little bit of the side has come off. Okay, okay so now that they're, there, you've, you've scarified them. You put them in a container and you put some water in, to, just enough to cover them. It's warm water and you let them soak overnight. Seeds like to germinate in warm temperatures. If you put them in cold water, they will germinate, but it may take really a really long time. Warm water, not hot, not boiling, Warm water, warm to the touch of your hand, um, is good for, for that. And you leave them generally overnight or 24 hours. And then you take the seeds and plant them in a, a pot. Okay, Mammy, so first you're going to dig your hole about twice the size of the thing that you're going to plant. So you can look at here and see how big the marigold is and dig a hole that's about twice that circumference. Yeah. Marigolds are good for keeping away predatory bugs like hornworms that are going to come and attack our beautiful tomatoes here. We want to keep them safe naturally so we're going to use marigolds which are distasteful to bugs that want to eat them. Okay. Okay. So then you're going to squeeze around the plastic part of the container. Now see if you can pull it out real gently. Yeah, you can tip it a bit. Does it want to come? Squeeze it. Ooh. There you go. And then you're going to refill in your hole with the dirt that you dug and keep the marigold even with the level of dirt soil here. Oh, there's a little worm. We want him to live because we like worms. So we're going to put him back in there. Now you're going to press down around the marigold. Give it a nice bed to sleep in. Okay, now you give it a little bit of water. That will help him take root to that area. and. Turn into a nice big plant. Nurture your garden through compost management. You now have a choice. Will you garden organically by using organic materials and methods? Or will you use chemical fertilizers, insecticides, and herbicides? The plants respond to nurturing and care and don't know the difference. Again, it's a personal choice. 
Composting is the lifeblood in a garden. Cow manure, alpaca, pony, goat, and worm castings are great manures for your garden. Chicken manure is very hot, so it has to age for 45 to 60 days before applying to the crops. Green hot manures will actually burn the crops. All manures except worm castings need to be aged before it can be used as a fertilizer. Horse and pony manure should age for three to four months or longer. Many horses are given antibiotics and other drugs, so aging the manure will deplete the medications. Horse and pony manure also have weed seeds from the hay, so using this kind of manure should be used with caution. Worm castings is one of the best manures to use in the urban garden because you control what they eat. Raising worms for small gardens is ideal and highly recommended. What got you started in this? Well, when we moved up here, I started volunteering at the community garden. I didn't know anything about gardening, but I wanted to learn something new in retirement. So I started volunteering at the garden and learning all about growing things and learning about soil and fertilizing the soil. So that's actually how I got interested um, after hanging out at the garden and learning from all these wonderful people. Um, I thought, I wanna try that at home. Um, you know, we don't have a big, cause we live in an HOA community. Mm -hmm. We don't have a big homestead area or anything like that. So I thought, what could I do on a small scale? So I figured I would start with the worm and the vermicomposting. Um, and then I would start a little, um, tower garden that I could harvest some herbs from and maybe some lettuces and stuff like that. And I figured it was a little thing that I could do at home, especially during the winter months when it's not gardening season. Okay, so this is our vermicomposting bin. And so I'm gonna take off the lid and you'll see some of our food scraps on here. And you'll see the soil and some of their bedding, which is just leaves and um, paper, shredded paper and stuff like that. And so this is the layer that the worms are in right now. We feed them on the top. So this is the first layer. Underneath here is there's a filter layer under there where um, the liquid is filtered. So I'll show you that. And so you can see some of the castings have come through. And then once the worms turn this layer um, into more worm castings, then I will add this second layer on top, put some bedding, put some food in there. The worms will migrate up through the holes and then I will start feeding them in this bin and I will be left with this bin underneath that is just the worm castings. I can harvest them for the garden. We started with 500 worms, um, but they said that, you know, they would um, multiply and stuff like that. So we started with the 500. So I'm not sure where it can go up to. I'm kind of curious to see myself how it does. But, you know, we plan on keep rotating those layers and stuff like that to uh, hopefully we'll be able to see, you know. I'm just feeding them once a week because there's, you know, they're not... You know, they're still acclimating, they're still new and stuff like that. But yeah, I'm told that, yeah, you just start increasing it. You'll be able to tell as they go through it quicker. Um, and then I'm just, you know, spritzing them with water to keep everything moist in there and stuff every like three days or so. Yeah. 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 Pretty simple. The nasturtium's doing good. He's very happy. So you water up here in the top and you go to the, um, the top line because there's five tiers, so you fill to the top line. It's engineered beautifully as far as how it waters, how it trickles down into this layer, but then also it comes down to each layer and they have watering bins in between there. So yeah, this top um, layer, I've got all my herbs. I've got cilantro, basil, and some chives over there, and then I've got the nasturtium. The second layer is sort of my lettuces and greens. I've got spinach, arugula, kale, here's some baby greens and some lettuces. And then the third layer, I have strawberry plants. Now these I did as starts. Yeah, so I have three strawberry plants. 
um, in this third layer. And the bottom layer, or this fourth layer, is root vegetables. I've got my beets, parsnips, um, some carrots, some radishes um, in that layer. And then on the bottom, I've got my peppers, which haven't come up yet. They have, um, and then the tomato plants and the, the these are both tomato. This is a cherry tomato and a regular tomato. Mm -hmm. They are both, yeah, starting to sprout. So, and by the time that they're ready to be fertilized, the worm castings should be ready to go. And then I'll be able to fertilize the garden. And you know, a lot of them are cut and come again so that we can eat year round. <laughs>